I'm sorry, what was that? So Okay. Um, I, I, I'll go ahead. Let me just go ahead. Uh, I want to take this opportunity. First of all, thank each and every one of you for coming on today. I want to thank Minister Emmanuel, who was steadfast, readily uh, going to be able to write, fill in for me because I was running late. But um, I found out something. Um, I tested the angels while I was driving <laughs> today. <laughs> and God told me when I got here, don't do that again. And so, listen, we want to obey the actual speed limits that are outside, and that includes me especially. So <laughs> I thank God. Hey, Mr. Manager, your microphone's on. I heard you laughing. <laughs> so, oh. again, no, it's all good. I do thank each and every one of you all for um, being here. We have a very exciting lesson. Uh, let me just say this. First of all, I want to thank Sister Tanya for writing the actual intro and reading the intro. She is a right tour. And thank God for Minister or Elder Brian Barrett doing the opening prayer. Uh, I may have missed any. Oh, yeah. We cannot forget uh, my dear friend, Sister Jessica, back from Israel. My God. All of us, we're just going down the street to witness. She She's going to Israel ministering all over the world. And um, uh, Sister Jessica, I'll say this to you. We're all in this together. And wherever God carries you, he's carrying us. And so I don't want you to ever feel that anything and anyone can hold you back from what God has in your life. And if God is sending you, we want to acknowledge that Lord is God and we're good with it and we're on your side. Amen. Because sometimes I'm gonna be honest with you, we don't no one likes to have to they call it losing. We don't lose people. If people get another assignment, it's like being in the military. Emmanuel will tell you, uh, uh the, the Barrett will tell you, when we're on an assignment, we might be at a place for three months, it could be a year, it could be three years, it could be longer, you know. So those are assignments. It doesn't mean we're losing people because we still were all in the air force. We just had to go to a deal with another assignment. And that's a good thing if it's a God thing. Amen. So without any further ado, I want to uh, also uh, thank some of our uh, newer people joining in. Uh, Brother Justin, I've heard some great things about you, young man. And I just believe that God has even more for you. And so we thank God for that. Sister Kate, you feeling a little bit better? You can wave your hand. Yeah, they're good, good, good. That's my buddy. Got to make sure Sister Kate taken care of. You see that brother with that bush? That's that bush. All uh, right, that brother. There you go, brother Julian. Thank God for him. There's brother Steve, the man with the, the, that smooth beard and everything. That's him. And it's a real beard, too. So thank God for you, brother Steve, and everybody. Sister Shyla, Sister Amanda, and Sister Lorelai, thank God for all of you all. Obviously, Deion Shay, y'all know, y'all know. Everybody on, because I can't just mention everybody, but I just want to acknowledge those that I saw real quickly. And let's get into the Word of God today. All right. So in the Word of God, today we have a lesson entitled, The Searing Has Begun. And when the Lord gave it to me, uh, this title, uh, I started thinking about the word searing, because I always try to break down that title to go right on the rest of the story. So when we hear the word searing, have you ever had anything seared? Uh, let's see, Brother Steve, have you ever had anything seared before? What does that word sear, seared or searing mean to you? Um, it's it's like brand. It's almost like branding. Like something something's been uh, done to you that just sticks with you forever. It does. It can't go away. Okay, and, and it's nothing wrong. This is what your understanding is. Uh, Elder Brian Barrett, when you hear the word searing, what does that mean to you, sear? I think about something like steak, where it's being cooked at a certain temperature in a certain way. Mm-hmm. Okay, very good. Uh, Elder Angel Barrett, how about you? Hmm. Mm. Something, something burned or scorched or... or uh, some fire has been set to it and it leaves an indelible mark. Ooh! Good. Don't be acting like you don't know that. If you're going to answer it like that, good golly. Very good answer. Searing. When we think about searing, 
I know myself as an actual chef, I sear food every almost every other day. And what we're doing, uh, we are putting a actual, we're applying heat to the substance of meat mainly. And what we're doing is we're putting a, we're going to harden that meat, but we're going to actually put apply a lot of fire to it or a lot of heat to it quickly. And when we put that fire to it, we're going to burn away anything that should not be on that meat because we want to get a good sear on it because we want that meat to be able to hold its juices. Well, when it's searing and it's searing of a mind, because we're going to be talking about the searing has begun, those searings are to burn away certain things. It's going to, for instance, years and years ago, they used to have these uh, thieves on television. And what they would do is they would go and burn all of their fingertips because if anyone wants to find out who robbed the store or took something from it, they would test their fingerprints and say, we'll look and see their fingerprints because all of us have an individual fingerprint. All of us have different fingerprints. They identify us. But if those, those fingerprints are burned away, they can't be identified. Well, today, I'm talking about the searing has begun. So if you don't mind, I'm going to be coming initially out of the book of First Timothy, the fourth chapter. <clears throat> and in First Timothy, the fourth chapter, uh, beginning at verse number one and two, it says some very unique things because that's the first time in the Bible I heard the word seared. And it's a very unique term. And I want to make sure that each of you get a chance to, like I said, at least hear and understand what's taking place because when I talk about the searing has begun, once you understand what searing means, it'll give you a, a, a really a, a good understanding. So 1 Timothy, the fourth chapter, begin at verse number one and two. I'm going to read it as follows. And one more page. There it is. And it says this, uh, this word. Now the spirit, that's a capital S. Anytime you see capital S, if you have a King James version, that means the Holy Spirit. Now the spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Verse number two, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot arm. The reason why I want to read that, that scripture there, uh, first of all, is because <clears throat> you're going to see, and you some of you have already seen, that in these last days, there are a lot of people who have no conscience or have no remorse for anything. They don't have any remorse for life, no concern for anything. They, it's, it's only about what's good for their sake. And when I talk about the searing has begun, the Bible says, as I just read, in these last days, there are going to be people to depart from the faith. Now, let me just ask this question real quickly. Um, Sister Shade, can a person depart from something that they're not in? Can they depart from something they're not in? No. No, you have to be in something to depart from it. So when the Bible says, uh, Minister Dion, some shall depart from the faith, who are these people do you think that actually Timothy is talking to? Well, sir, I say he's talking to the believers and that the believers will depart from the faith. Yeah, it is possible. And don't fool yourself. Just because you have dedicated yourself to the Lord doesn't mean that you can't go back out in the world. Doesn't mean that you can't find yourself trying to be who you used to be and you can actually depart the living God. <clears throat> One thing that we want to understand about today's lesson is that there are steps to having your conscience seared. When we talk about uh, in these last days, the Bible said there would be people and their conscience would be seared. Emmanuel, what part of a person is their conscience? That would be their soul and their mind. Mm -hmm. 
It's that part of their mind, the part of your thinking process. And when a person's conscious is seared, no longer can they recollect right from wrong, good from bad. Sister Jessica, have you ever met people who you just notice you, they just have no conscience? They can just do people any kind of way, and it seems like they have no conscience about it. How do they act? Self-centered, prideful. Mm-hmm. Very good. Just, just think about themselves, not others. Yeah. Self-centered, prideful. They only think about themselves. And when people are self-centered, when people are all about themselves, all about them, you'll find out everything they do and everything they see is all about them. It's all about them. And here's the deep part about it. They're always looking at everything and everyone else to blame thought on everything besides themselves. And you know what? In this story that I'm going to share today, you're going to see something about a believer, about a person who started out doing things right from God, for God. And then in the process of time, you're going to see how they slip right back into the world, but not just back into doing certain things they did. They got even worse. The Bible tells us that when demons, when these spirits, when they go out and they leave a person, they come back and they look. Don't just think that you got saved and all of a sudden you love the Lord and don't think that the enemy is not going to come after you. I'm going to say that again. When the enemy sees that you've now come to the Lord, he's going to plot and plan how he can get you back. Because you should know the devil doesn't like to lose anything. Um, Brother Julian, have you ever seen people seem like they were on the right track, they were doing good one time, and then after a little time, they start getting worse and worse and worse? Have you ever seen that happen? And what things did they do? Yeah, I have. It was like they like they spiraled back into their old ways, but then mm -hmm. it became more progressive. Mm -hmm. Very good. Sin is progressive. Sin is ever moving and is always the lead to getting you worse than you ever started. That's how sin is. It's like having a reprobate mind. The Bible says in the Romans, the first chapter, it was talking about the children of Israel in the Old Testament. And the Bible says, because when they knew God, they failed to glorify him as God. And when they did that, God gave them over to a reprobate mind because they, re they refused to glorify God as God. And they would not retain God's word in their mind. When we put out these memory verses, and I have Minister Dion put out these memory verses every week, it is designed to protect you from attacks from the enemy. Now, I will say to people, when it's very cold, because I know most of you all are out in Wisconsin and some in other states and everything, other uh, cities, when you're actually out there and it's cold, if you don't put a coat on, such a Kate, what's going to happen when it's cold out there and you decide, I'm not wearing a coat, what's going to happen to that person? You're going to get a cold. You're going to get a cold, and if they don't do something about it when it's a cold, what, 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 what will happen next? It'll just get worse and worse. And they'll get the flu. And then yeah. if they don't take care of the flu, what are they going to happen to happen next? Probably going to have to go to the hospital. I mean, it'll just get worse and worse. It'll get worse and worse. Now, we do that. We know this just by natural life. If I don't, if the weather is a certain weather and I don't prepare for it and wear a coat, then I'm going to possibly get a cold. It'll start with the sniffing. It'll start with the actual nose running, that type of thing. If I don't treat it at a cold, it's more than likely going to turn into the flu. And if it turns into a flu, you'll get high fever, sweat, all kinds of things will go on. You'll feel cramping in your body. If you don't take care of it at a, at a flu, it'll become pneumonia. 
And when it becomes pneumonia, it's going to affect your lungs. It's going to affect your breathing. It's going to affect your thinking, everything about you. And if you don't take care of it at the pneumonia, it can kill you. What I'm saying all that, to say the same thing about our mind. If we don't take care and get the word of God in our mind, it is going to get progressively worse, as Brother Julian said. It's going to be step one step to another. So I'm going to show you about a young man today in the word of God who never took care of these things and these signs that were in his life. And things got progressively worse. I wanted to encourage each and every one of you, when you have embraced the Lord as your Savior, realize in your mind you cannot go back to doing what you did before because what you did before kept you as you were in your past. You can't keep doing what you used to do. You've got to change environments. If you keep on without a coat on, you're going to keep on getting sick and it'll lead to these steps. So you have to realize what type of environment I'm in. When you are saved, when you give your life to the Lord Jesus, you're in a totally different environment than you used to be in. And you have to pull off those old ways and put on new ways to cover yourself in the Lord. You'll find me in the book of 2 Samuel, uh, the 11th chapter. There are certain stories in the Bible that when I read or when I go over them or I study them, they actually affect me because I see how innocent people can get so swayed further and further away from the things of God. And when, when you see that, if you have a heart, your heart goes out to them. Your heart goes out to them because you want the best for people. So in this story, I'm going to share, I'm going to read a few scriptures real quick. Uh, it's going to begin the 11th chapter, verse number one and two, I'm going to be reading. And uh, here we go. Uh, one, two, and three, I think. And it came to pass after the years was expired, the year was expired at the time when the kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with them and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah, but David tarried still in Jerusalem. And it came to pass in the eventide that David rose from his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof, he saw a woman washing herself and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired after the woman. And one said, is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite, verse four. And David sent messengers and took her. And she came unto him and he lay with her. For she was purified from her uncleanliness and she returned unto her house. So you just heard verse one through four of 2 Samuel, the 11th chapter. Let me explain something to you all. No matter what position you ever have in life that does not give you the right to take what's not yours. I'm gonna say this again. No matter what position you have in life, it does not give you the right to take what's not yours. And especially if God didn't give it to you. Here is David, King David in the Bible. And most of us have heard a lot of great stories and things about King David, the good, the bad, the ugly. King David has now been put into the kingship and he has fought several battles in being the king. And he would fight off the Amalekites, and he would fight out these Jebusites, and he'd fight off the Amorites, and he was fighting out all these battles. Listen, just because you're fighting uh, 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 a lot of situations that may be in your life, and it seems like you're getting victory, don't think that you got victory over everything, not too quickly. Because there is something that can take you down. 
Don't believe me? Watch this. Everyone who has a battle going on in your life about something, raise your hand. Uh, you see my hand is up. Everyone. Maybe one person that doesn't have their hand up. <laughs> but listen, we all have our hand up. And the reason I say that is because sometimes we can get complacent. In our mind, we can think, oh, I got it all together. I'm doing good. I'm doing better than I ever done before. And I'm doing pretty all right then. Here David is, he's fought all these battles and he's won victory and victory and victory. And in this day, as you heard me read in verse number one of chapter 11 of 2 Samuel, the Bible says that all the kings, it was an appointed time that all the kings would get up and they would go forth to fight the battle. But David, the same David, that was a David that God fought for. And even when King Saul, his own king, was after him, God protected him time after time after time. God gave David great things. And I want you to know, from these battles that gave, uh, David won, he became promoted more and more until it got to the point where God even said, you know what? This man is going to be the next king over Israel. Millions of people are under his uh, guardianship. But there's a problem. The problem is, is David became too comfortable. When I say, when I say David became too comfortable, Sister Tanya, what do you think I mean when a person becomes too comfortable and secure with themselves? What do you think I mean? Um, I think that people stop trying. You know, mm -hmm. when they become too comfortable, especially if everything is going their way, they just think, well, the next thing's going to go my way because everything's been going my way. So I'm not worried about it. That's my daughter. <laughs> yeah. Listen. Don't let the blue skies fool you. Don't let the calm waters fool you. There's an old saying that says, still waters run deep. Do you know most people that are swimmers that die and get drowned is because they don't see there is a rip current under the actual top surface of the water. Unfortunately, uh, my son, Emmanuel, his, um, one of his best friends, I think it was his best friend, was out swimming one day. Excellent swimmer had been known for swimming all these different places, but got caught up in a riptide and that riptide took him away. If he was just looking at the surface, there's no problem. We look at the surface of so many things. I look at all of you and all of you all look like, man, you guys got it made. Y'all you know, are happy, y'all, you know, everybody is here grieving, but I don't know. There's somebody who's grieving right now. There's someone who's going through right now in their mind and wishing that they could get out of this situation that they're in. There's someone in an unhappy marriage or an unhappy relationship. There's someone who's sick in their body or a loved one that's sick. There's someone going through something that they just wish I could deal with, but they're not telling. Sometimes these things become silent frustrations. One of the worst frustrations that you can have is a silent frustration. Um, Brother Steve, when I say a silent frustration, these are people who don't share uh, what they're going through. Why don't you think some of these people don't share the things that they're going through with others? Um, it could be pride. It could be uh, it could be that they're that they don't want to um, bring others into that problem with them. Mm -hmm. um, could be a lot of things. Sure. Brother Julian, you've seen people who really don't say uh, much, but boy, if you step on their toe the wrong way, they go off. What do you think is the reason they go really off when somebody steps on their toe and they seem to be quiet people? <clears throat> I would say it's because all that pent up frustration Mm -hmm. And like attitude towards something or something that they can't do, then like that one little thing you'll do or say, they'll take mm -hmm. it out on you. Woo, buddy. 
And when they get ready to go off, they go off all the way. Sister Shade, have you ever seen anybody that's like that? Seemingly, they're real quiet. But all of a sudden, when you you kind of touch them, touch, poke on them the wrong way, they go off. They're upset. Yeah. How do they act? Um, Like you just killed their dog and threw it in the river. I don't know. Like, they go off. It could be the smallest thing. And you just, it set them off. Yeah. And those same people, they're going through sign of frustration. They are holding things inside. And believe it or not, most of us are like that. We hold things inside. And we sometimes think we have no one to give this over to. And when we don't give it over, what we do is we harbor it. We hold on to it. And what we try to do, we try to mask it. You know, it's like I got a flame of fire and I'm trying to block it so it don't burn people up. But it's like if anybody, have you ever heard yourself say it? If anybody just says one more thing to me, it's going to be on and popping. Those are the things we say. And then when they go off, let me talk to people who I know had, had tempers in the past. Uh, Mr. Dion, you're one of them hotheads. You're one of those ones who like to fight. I mean, back in the day, you know what I mean? But, you know, now you're, you know, you're, you're saved. You're, you're refined now. But what is it that used to really get you so riled up and angry and want to fight? Um, well, sir, I was bullied somewhat growing up. So, like, once we got a little older, I wasn't, like, the type to fight. I was a funny guy. So, if somebody said something that got me upset, I would say something to make them really reevaluate themselves and look themselves in the mirror. Uh -huh. <laughs> So in turn, that would turn into them getting mad at me. And nine times out of ten, they were like six two, and I'm right. fine. <laughs> I would work my way into talking it out. But yeah, I was one of those where I hit you where your self esteem kind of as well. That's called an instigator. Instigator will take if you got some flame and some you upset, but instigators can go and they can say these certain things, and they get. I mean, they get you so right. It's like why do you have to get under my skin? Just yeah. All right, let me go with another hothead. Hey, Mr. Emmanuel, this is a cat. I would never hear about fighting. He, he would not fight. But somehow, when he got older, it's like he want to have jobs where he was the bouncer. What? Who, who, who wants to fight? Mr. Emmanuel, tell me about this. Where, where do you think this anger came from, this issue about just, eh? I, I believe you you hit the nail on the head, silent frustration. So a lot of built-in uh, anger that um, you, uh, you know, you, you uh, release that, taking it out on others in many different forms. Amen. That's it. A lot of it, we just try to hold in and take it out. And then now, let me just say this, even though you can be saved, you can have things on the inside that you haven't given over to God yet. That's the truth. There's things on the inside. And listen, it's more than just saying, okay, Lord, take away. I've, I've done this, so I know what I'm talking about. Lord, take away anything to me that's not like you. That might have worked for maybe one or two things in my life. But the rest of the stuff, God is like, no, nah, no, nah, I'm going to work it out of you so you can see it won't be to your advantage doing this. So what happens here? We have King David. And King David, he's a great king. He's a wonderful king. He's a loving king. But King David has some issues that have been unresolved from his past. Unresolved issues. Elder Barrett, Elder uh, Brian Barrett, what do you think I mean? He has unresolved issues from his past. What do you think I mean by that? I think you mean some issues that weren't dealt with at one time or another and mm -hmm. they just kind of like everybody was saying just kind of built up over time and you just not thinking about it on the surface but it's there mm -hmm. oh watch this uh elder angel bear i know you you know you like to say you do a lot of good thinking and everything elder angel bear when you're dealing with frustrations i'm not talking about between you and your husband i'm just saying any frustrations because i know i know people First thing they're thinking, oh, she got some problem with Elder Brian. No, 
Just frustrations. When you deal with frustrations, how do you deal with, or how did you deal with them when you weren't saved? How did you deal with them? When I wasn't saved, I didn't pray. Um, I complained a lot to other people, um, cried a lot, and did a, a, a little bit of cussing too. What? You mean to tell me you, what? You know what? Thank you for being honest. Most of us did. Uh, ain't no most. My, I, I, almost everybody. Almost everybody. I know there'll be a, a few angels. There's always a few angels. You know, I never cursed. Yeah, I know, but you give you about you almost shot the sheriff, and you killed the deputy. Look, we know that there are situations that we all have to deal with. I know we've been talking about since we were were not saved or didn't give our life to the, uh, Christ. But let me just say this. Even when we get saved, we still got issues. Yes, we do. When I got saved, guess what I did? I used to cuss. I was doing all kind of things. I'm not going to go through. I'm just going to say I was. I still had a remnant of all that sin in my life. There's no such thing as instant holiness. In other words, you have to, just like we had to learn how to do things at our job or wherever we do, we also have to learn how to live godly. And that's through the word of God. That's This is why we have these Bible studies. And thank God we have an interactive Bible study where we can talk to each other and we can encourage each other through and uh, in and of the word of God. So here's David. He's king now. The other kings have gone out to battle. And David decides, I really want... I want to stay at home. I don't, you know, I don't need to be at battle. Not, nah, you know. Isn't it amazing how the things we used to do in order to be successful, when you become successful, you don't want to do them anymore. Last week, I talked about inspect what you expect out of whatever you're doing. Because if you don't inspect it, sometimes we got to learn how to inspect ourselves. That's the number one. David's not fighting against the Amorites, against the Jebusites, against the Midianites. He's not fighting against any of them. David doesn't realize that what he thinks is now a time of peace is not the time of peace because his greatest battle is coming his way and his greatest battle is coming from within. I like what Sister Tanya said earlier. She says, you know, a lot of times we think that we already got together. We don't see there being a problem. It looks like everything's fine. So why should there, there shouldn't be a problem? Everything's good. Just because we see the blue skies, just because the grass is green, doesn't mean that there's, a, there's not an inward battle. And here's the reason why the Lord led me to this lesson is because he wants us to see also that it may be when we see certain things happening, not just with ourselves, but those that are closest to us, we could do something to help them out. David is king. And as far as David is concerned, I got it made. I'm the king. There's nobody really over me. I got it made. I'm doing what I really want to do. And so David says, I'm going to stay back. I'm not going to battle. I'm sending out my other people to do that. It's like how people do with prayer. I, if I have people praying for me, I don't have to really pray for myself. That's a mentality, even though they won't say it out loud, but that's how a lot of people act. I don't have to pray. I mean, come on, you know, I don't really see a lot of situations. I'm good. Well, what happens here, David is not in the place where God's called him to be. And he decides, I'm going to go out on the palace on the balcony. And he's, as he's walking around on the roof of the actual palace, he looks. And he sees something. He sees from his advantage point, because a palace is a lot higher than other people's homes and everything like that. He sees a young lady bathing nakedly on the actual, from his, from his terrace. He can see this lady bathing nakedly. And the Bible says she was beautiful to look on. Now, I want you all to know this. There's nothing that just happens 
There's no such thing as happenstance. You all should know that we do have a devil who is trying to pull us back into the world and try to pull us back into what we were doing so that he can get us away from God. Because the longer we stay in God, the more peace we'll have, the more we'll be able to have answers to things in our life. So he's wanting to pull us down. So what he does, he is putting this temptation in front of David. Now watch this. Sister Kate, you're my friend. I can talk to you. That's why I'm talking. But I, I need you to be around. I do. Sister Kate, do you eat liver? You don't eat liver. Suppose I suppose I put a gigantic liver piece of liver and put gravy on it and onions. Would you eat it then? I mean, being a kind friend that I am, I will try it. Oh, I'm talking about. Do you like liver? No. No. So then, no matter how much, if I put a thousand pieces of liver in front of you, are you going to start liking it then? No. Let me say the reason I'm asking that there, because I want each and every one of you all to know, the devil doesn't waste his time with temptation. If you're being tempted right now with anything, it's because what he has seen you react to. It's not a temptation if you don't want it. <laughs> I'm like Sister Kate. I'm not a liver, liver guy. I'm not. It doesn't matter if you fry it, if you broil it, if you shoosh it. I don't care what you do to it. I'm not, I'm, you will never see me. Hey, where are you going, Pastor Scott? Oh, I'm going out here. Give me some liver. Yo, yo, what's up? I will, that's not me. You might as well just go tell that person right there. You're not Pastor Scott. Get out of here. Because I do not like, I am like Sam. I am. I don't like liver here or there. I don't like liver anywhere. I don't like it in the rain and train. It's, I don't like it. I'm like Sam. I am. So let me just say this to you all. If you're being tempted, it is because of something that you have shown yourself to be gravitating to. David doesn't realize it. Oh, no. Let me just say this. David doesn't think that anyone knows his weaknesses, his internal weaknesses. Sister Tanya, what do you think I mean by when I say internal weaknesses? Um, like you said before, just basically his unresolved issues. So he has things, you know, that are from the past that he's still dealing with, with emotions and things like that are things in his mind. Mm -hmm. Very good. Let me just say this to you all. The very thing that you don't like to do that God wants you to do is part of your temptation. See, we think that all temptation is just the bad temptation. Oh, he's tempted to lie, tempted to cheat, tempted to... But sometimes God will have us and want us to do something and we'll say no. But inside, we're thinking, well, you know what? I just don't like that. I'm just not that type of person. I want you to know that if it is something that God is wanting you to do and you're saying no to it, it's because you're being tempted and God realizes that you have a problem with God telling you something to do. You have a problem with authority. You do. So David sees this woman and he says, hmm, I want to find out who this young lady is. He inquires, the Bible said, about her. Uh, Brother Julian, why do you think David was inquiring about this woman uh, that's on this balcony that looks really good, that's naked, bathing? He's probably trying to see if she has, like, a husband or any kids out there. Yeah. And think about it. Uh, Minister, uh, Minister Dion. Think about it. Why would he inquire about this woman? And he's knowing he got other wives. Why is he inquiring about her? Because uh, he's attracted to her in some type of way. Mm hmm. Yeah, he's trying to give us the PG version. Uh, he's uh, attracted to her in some type of way. The woman's naked, man. The Bible says that. She's on this balcony. 
She's bathing. And the Bible says she looks good. If the Bible says you look good, then you better look good. You look good. And he's trying to, you have to understand, he's a king. He's a prestigious king. But there's something tempting him. And he has to act in a certain way where he doesn't give away that he's really that attracted to her. So, Brother Steve, how do you think David is acting, knowing that he's being tempted by this young lady and he, he's got these people around him, so he, he has to act a certain way? How does he act when he's trying to find out information about her? Uh, probably coyly. He's probably, he's probably like, oh, uh, well, is she, uh, is she uh, single? Uh, right, you know. <laughs> right, and and yeah. two, think about it. He's married. All right, I gotta I gotta bring this to real time, okay? Sister Kate, see, that's why I gotta go to Sister Kate because she that's my friend. Sister Kate, you married, right? <sighs> How? What, I'm not saying your husband. I God, God forbid, I'm not saying that, but. When a woman is trying to get uh, his attention, what type of thing do women do to try to get uh, men's attention, especially if they know you marry? I guess they'll, I'm not sure. I mean, like- Girl, you better watch a few more different? movies. I know, I don't watch movies. <laughs> yeah. Elder Angel Mary, we gotta help, we gotta help this Kate out because she don't know how anybody can tip her husband. How how do they do that? Somebody will try to call me now. <laughs> uh, they might show some more skin and um, the the real sexy parts of them, or put nothing on at all, like Bathsheba did. Yeah, there you go. Then how are you gonna tempt the person out? Yeah, I got a full. I got on my my coat. I got on my dress. I got on everything. I got a hat on my head. I got no. She just seemingly happened to be on that other that other house where uh, obviously she had curtains. They did have curtains in those days. Don't think there was Stone Age. They had curtains, and she had the curtain twirl over, and she's bathing in the nude, and there's, there's David's balcony, and yeah. And so David is being tempted. So David inquires, who is this woman? And as I read, they said, oh, this is Uriah's wife. Mm. And the Bible says, even though they told David that it's Uriah's wife, David sent for her. David said, bring her to me. So they bring her. He's the king. They bring her to the king. Sister Shay, you heard me earlier say, just because you have position doesn't mean that you should do, you know, you do anything you can or anything you want. David is now displaying what's actually in his heart. He's displaying what's going on in his thoughts. Because let me say this, when you're being tempted, by the devil in your mind, because all temptation begins in a, as a thought in the mind. We've got to get rid of that thought. We've got to put our mind on the word of God or something else to get that thought out of our mind, because if not, it's going to work on your conscience. And David knows right from wrong. You see, as a, a conscience becomes seared, it's becoming burnt away. It's reasoning, the actual conscious is the actual jury to what your body is going to do in the court of law. It is the reasoning of why you don't do certain things and why you do do certain things. And there's what's going on. The enemy is bombarding his mind, trying to get him to think to do what's wrong and to be able to tear him down in front of the people's eyesight. He's a man after God's heart. But what David doesn't realize, he doesn't realize just because he's saved, just because he loves the Lord, doesn't mean he doesn't have other things in his mind and in his life. So here David calls and sends for, he's bringing the thing that's tempting him closer to him. I want you to know, uh, Pastor Scott, me, 
I pray every day, Lord, keep me even when I don't feel like being kept. Because there are times, if you'll see here in the life of David, he's not feeling like being kept. He's feeling like, I've seen this woman, I've seen this flesh, and let me just say this as a, a side note. Flesh, our flesh, our skin, our body is a magnet to sin. I was talking to Minister Emmanuel uh, about a year ago. And when that actual, when that, Flesh is around other flesh like a magnet. It joins together to it. It comes together. You could be like having a magnet. You have a magnet on one side of the table and push it near a little piece of metal and automatically it'll, call, it'll try to attach itself. All right, watch this. Um, Brother Julian, does an actual uh, magnet have a brain? No, it does not. No, it doesn't. So how then, how, hold on a second. How then does it attract other, this other metal if it gets close enough? How does it automatically attach itself to other metals? It has something that's called a magnetic field. Mm -hmm. and, um, within the metal, it has some type of property that it just, it feeds off of it and it wants to be connected to it. Automatically. It doesn't have to have a brain. Well, don't you know our flesh, our skin, our body is attracted to sin. It's attracted to fornication. It's attracted to adultery. It's attracted to sin. And it doesn't have to, it doesn't have, to have a brain. Automatically, it's attracted. As soon as it's around it, it wants to do sin. Now, watch this. It is the brain that tells this body what it wants to do. And our conscious is that part of us that should guide us away from wrong things, but there are times that our conscience is like, you know what? I don't care what you're feeling. I want to join myself together with him. And the same thing with David. David knows that he loves the Lord. He knows that God has been on his side. He knows God has given him victory, but what he doesn't realize is that his flesh is weak. So he now calls for Bathsheba to come over and he has these people bring her over so they know about her being brought over to David. But what they don't know is David the king has lied with her, has actually had a relation, a sexual relationship with her. Watch this. Sin is progressive. It'll start out with just the thought, as you saw, then the inquiry, as you heard, then as the actual act, as you're seeing. But it doesn't stop there because sin, the Bible says in the book of James, that sin is when a man is drawn away of his own lust. James, the first chapter, verses 13 through 15. When a man is drawn away on his own lust and enticed, and then that lust bringeth forth sin, and sin will bring him forth death. Now David has fornicated, or he's an adulterer, and he's now had sex with this woman. You would think that it ended there. But now, watch this. This woman who's married did not want to have sex with David because she realized David, she's telling David, David, I'm in a relationship with my husband. And my husband is one of your soldiers. So now, here's David's thinking. Man, I've done this wrong. I've done this sin. And instead of asking forgiveness, instead of asking to repent and calling on, you know, calling on the Lord, he doesn't call on the Lord. What he does, he's going to try to sever uh, his relationship with anything to keep him from her. He's going to try to cut off her relationship with her husband in order that he could do what he wants with her. So David does this. <clears throat> he devises a plan where he goes and has Uriah, who was one of those soldiers who went out to battle while David is sitting at home lusting his wife. -hoo -hoo. Hey, this is a good time for everybody to play crazy. He ain't talking to me. Nope, he ain't talking. Hey, this is, if you don't want anybody to think it's you, do this. Sure, that had nothing to do with me. 
I'm not lusting anyone today. They don't see it, do they? No, we think that just because we got four walls that people can't see our, our lust. But let me tell you about lust and about sin. Sin always starts out in the corner, but it ends up taking over the whole field. Sin starts out in the corner, but eventually it'll take over the whole field. Don't think every, nobody sees what you're up to because I want you to know, it doesn't have to mean that I'm just, I'm talking about just fornication or just, no, it could be anything. Anything that's ungodly, Bible said, whatever is done in darkness shall be manifested by the light. Eventually, whatever that is, as you've heard me say before, whatever slows you down, eventually it will pull you down. And the worst part, we're all gonna see it. So David devises a way and he says here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring Uriah back, her husband, and I'm going to have him go and I'm going to have him go and uh, go home with his wife. He's been in battle all this time. So surely he's going to have have a, uh, make love to his wife. And if he makes love to his wife, he'll think it's his baby because now David hears and fears something else that comes up. Now out of his lust and out of his sin of fornication with Uriah's wife, he hears she's pregnant. Oh, my God. Progression. So David goes and David says, OK, uh, Uriah, send for Uriah. Have him come back here. So Uriah comes back here. David meets him. And David says, Uriah, I appreciate you going out there to battle. I appreciate you doing such a great job. And you know what? I want to make sure you have what you want. So you go home and enjoy your wife. And, you know, by all means, have a good time. David now is becoming a phony friend. We call it frenemy. They're acting as a friend, but they're really your enemy. Don't ever forget this. I remember I grew up on this. Uh, Barris might remember this. There's a song out years ago. They smile in your face, always trying to take your place, backstabbers. Just because somebody is saying that they really want something to work out for you doesn't mean they really mean that. Doesn't mean they really mean that. I mean, you know, there are people who, in one sense, they are trying to sing your praises, but on the other, other hand, they're plotting to take you down. And you know what they want? They want whatever that is that is dear and whatever that is that's near to you in order to take your place. So here it is. David goes and sends Uriah back home and Uriah says, I'm not going home. I don't want to go there because I want to be with you, David, because we got men that are dying in the fields and I don't want to leave you. So Uriah refuses to go home. Now David doesn't know what to do. This man, I thought if he'd go home and he'd get, listen to how he's plotting, working along with the enemy. This is a man that was working for God, and now he's working double time for the enemy, trying to plot another person's demise. So David says, okay, this is what I'm going to do now. Since Uriah does not want to go home, I'm going to send him back into battle. I'm going to send a letter by another soldier and give it to my general, whose name is Joab. And I'm going to tell Joab that when Uriah gets out there, I want you to put him near the front. Put him in the far, the heat of the battle. And when you put him in the heat of the battle, I want the men to retreat and leave him out there for the bowmen, the ones who have arrows and bows, for them to shoot and kill him. This is King David, the one who has the heart after God, the one who's the great uh, king and the one who's loyal to God and the people of God. But see, they don't know this. Only person knows about this is now Joab, his general. And just like it was told him to do, that's exactly what Joab did. And so Uriah goes out there. They put him in the front. As soon as the enemy starts attacking them, they go and retreat on him. They don't tell Uriah that God, I mean, they don't tell them that David has now told everybody else to retreat. And they deliberately have him killed. And Uriah sends a message back to David and says, David, 
Now uh, Uriah is killed just like you wanted. And David, with this sense of false humility, says, who can ever tell where the Lord and the deaf angel will strike? And he was the one who instigated it. Don't ever be the type of person who you are trying to set people up and lie on people and lay in wait for people to fall. And then while you're doing it at the same time, I want you to know this here, God is watching. So here it is. David says, well, now that Uriah's killed, only thing left to do is for me to marry his wife. This is what David's plotting. But what David didn't realize is that God was speaking to his prophet, which was his pastor. And the pastor of King David, his name was Nathan. And Nathan comes to David, and Nathan uses a short story to tell and show David about his own self. Sometimes a pastor, I'm a pastor, I don't always go to everyone and say, you know what, the devil's about to take you out. Because I already know the first thing they're going to do is say, not me. No, I'm fine. Everything's good with me. So he uses a simple parable. And he tells David about this rich man that had all these sheep. And that there was a poor man, there was another man that came in to visit him. And that instead of killing any of his sheep, he had like 99 sheep. And instead of killing any of his own sheep, he went to a poor man's house next door and grabbed the one sheep that he had. And then the Bible goes in the 12th chapter of, of, of this uh, second Samuel. And then the Bible says, this man who only had the one sheep loved that sheep, held that sheep close to him, fed the sheep, took care of that sheep. And this rich man went and took that man's ewe lamb, which is a sheep, baby sheep. He goes and takes it and killed it and then served it to a person coming to visit them. And the man who was poor had no more sheep left. And David, when he heard this story from Nathan, his pastor, the prophet, he goes and gets all just re resounded. And he said, that man should be killed. And Nathan looks at David and says, thou art the man. You are that person. And then David, I mean, then Nathan began to pronounce judgment on David for the sins that he did. He told David that the sword of God would never leave his house. He told him that his family was going to be torn from him, just as he tore the family of Uriah and Bathsheba away. And from that day, they never addressed Bathsheba. Even though he married Bathsheba, they never addressed her as Bathsheba. They would always address her in the word of God as Bathsheba, Uriah's uh, wife, even though Uriah was dead. Because it was so wrong for what D David did. The other part is, a part of that is, is that God also said that that first child from Bathsheba would die. Sometimes we don't realize the gravity of the sins that we may commit. If we had dealt with them where it was just in our conscience, they would have not been so strong in our life. And here's what I'm saying to my conclusion today. Don't allow the enemy to keep you by yourself. There are others that saw that David had weaknesses and had situations that were going to tear him apart and also tear his family apart. But we have to be of such that when we see people and we see them not doing what they need to do, we see them not acting the way they used to act, we have to be able to go and encourage them and let them know, hey, listen, it can get better than this. Let me let you know, David, you got all these other wives. You don't have to, you don't have to go to this one. Don't let your calmness of your relationship make you think you can't lose your loved one. I know what I'm talking about. Don't ever think just because you got longevity and you've been with people a while that you can't lose them. I know what I'm talking about. All it takes is to get the wrong mentality and what you have. Don't remain so secure. You better keep loving what's loving you. That's the truth. Keep loving what's loving you. And then let God always be first in your life.
So without any further ado, that's as far as I'm going to go today. Went a little bit over, but I will say this to you. There's a lot in this message. Please go back over it. Please don't take it lightly because God would not have had me to speak these things if it was not meant for you to hear. Amen. So again, without any further ado, we're going to have Minister Dion uh, end us in a word of prayer. This is how, and those were the steps that lead to a seared conscience because David never would have thought that it went from just a bad thinking about another person's wife to actually a murderer. Minister Dion, would you lead, lead us in prayer, please? Everybody by your heads. Um, Heavenly Father, we just thank you for another day, Lord. We thank you for this uh, anointed message. Um, Father, we thank you for even hearing about the searing of the mind, Lord, and you just enlightening us on these things that can happen. And uh, yes. Father, I'm praying that uh, you just bless the man of God for even blessing us with such a message and just being diligent in his studying to be able to, uh, you know, distribute your word to us. Uh, but Lord, throughout this week, I'm praying that you just keep us, even when we feel, uh, don't feel like being kept, keep us from the searing of our mind, Lord. Keep us from the ten temptations of the enemy, Lord. And when we are tempted, Lord, I pray that we can just call on you, Lord, that we can get into your word, Lord, and that we can just seek you in prayer, Lord, and that you just deliver us, Lord. Father, I'm praying that you just instill in us thoughts that are after your own, Lord. And Father, I pray that our actions reciprocate who you are in our lives and uh, reflect who, uh, who you are in us. Um, but for Lord, I'm just thankful for this message. Once again, I'm thankful for you just um, giving us clear instructions on how to handle these things and even just showing us the example of how things can go far left if we indulge in them. Um, but Lord, I'm thankful for each and every person that's here, each and every person that uh, will hear this message, you know, once it's recorded. Uh, I'm praying it's a blessing to each and every one of us, Lord, and that you just continue to move in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you all so very much once again uh, for coming out. Brother Justin, so good to see you, my friend. And uh, hey, amen, we're praying with you and for you every day. God will continue strengthening you. Sister Laura Lai, thank you for joining in. Sister Amanda, I miss you. Uh, and, and I know you're not the other Amanda. We got two Amandas. And uh, Sister Tanya's always telling me, there's two Amandas. Okay. Sister Talisha, you know I miss you, lady. And uh, hey, Sister Kate, I hope you're still getting better and better. And uh, thank you, Brother Steve, for just, like I said, being Brother Steve. That's it. So appreciate each and every one of you all. Take care. Sister Shyla, good to always have you also. We'll talk to you next week. Got a great message. Um, next Sunday, what I'm going to try to do, uh, if it's okay with you all, I'd like to have um, the Bible uh, study next Saturday because by next Sunday, okay. sure, I would like you all to be able to enjoy your entire Easter day. And so we'll have a short Bible study uh, next uh, next Saturday at the uh, same time that we normally do this Bible study. We'll have it next Saturday. And uh, I do appreciate each and every one of you all. Uh, God bless you. If you can make it, please do. If you can't, I understand. But again, we just want to be able to make sure we get the word out. Take care. God bless. We'll see you all soon. Bye-bye.